Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk TV. So, pop the kettle on. This is the Royal Tea. I'm Sarah Hewson. Coming up, Prince William's plan to end homelessness. Harry and Meghan labelled as grifters. Dior deal or no deal for the Sussexes. And the first royal ascot of the new reign. Joining me to discuss all that and lots more, a royal commentator and Talk TV regular, Afia Hagen, The Sun's royal editor, Matt Wilkinson, and Us Weekly host, Christine Ross. Prince William celebrated his first birthday as the Prince of Wales on Wednesday, as he turned 41 just days after committing to building social housing on Duchy of Cornwall land. In an interview with the Sunday Times, William said he wants to make it his mission to end homelessness in the UK once and for all, and plans to launch a really big project to take on the issue. Now, Matt, the details of the project have been kept under wraps uh, for now, but from what we've heard from the Prince of Wales mm. so far, what what is his vision? So. <laughs> We will be hearing about this big project um, in the next couple of weeks. We'll be hearing. I, I have been passed a lot of information. I've been given a briefing about about what he's actually going to do with this huge homelessness project. And there's certain things I can't tell you. But what I can tell you that isn't going to be in there is actually a commitment to building social housing. So he's he is authentic on homelessness. It's something. It's a campaign that he's been doing. We've been involved in since he was since he was a child. Princess Diana took him to see homeless people on the street, and he's a patron of, of many charities. It's something that's really close to his heart. But we will be hearing it. I say next couple of days, next couple of weeks. It's going to become a project that he will be invested in for the next for several more years. But there is a problem here because he did an interview with the Sunday Times mm. in which he has suggested that he wanted to build social housing on Duchy of Cornwall land. And that became the big headline. And that became the headline and there's a lot of praise for this. But, uh, you know, th th there isn't a commitment to that, unfortunately. And I think there's going to be a... If you look at William with, with the Duchy of Cornwall, he's a massive, massive landlord. He gets £20 million every year through the Duchy. Um, and they're building thousands of houses in two new housing projects around England at the moment. But there isn't social housing there. And I, I, I commend William for this homelessness project that we're going to hear about in the next couple of weeks. But I think he will face questions as to mm -hmm. what he is actually physically doing. Could he actually provide homes for... Um, uh, you know, for people who are struggling to, 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 to find a place to live, so... Because there is a slightly... There's a bit of a disconnect, isn't there, between someone who has multiple yeah. large properties yeah. talking about homelessness. Yeah. But he does see this as his life's work. I mean, he does. And there's big ambition there, isn't there, Afia? Absolutely. You know, he's talking about when he wants to talk to his children, George, Louis and Charlotte, about homelessness, when he will take them to a homeless centre. Uh, you know, he talks about going there age 11 with his mother, Diana, Princess of Wales. But there is a massive disconnect there. Someone who is a huge landlord making £20 million pounds a year and talking about homelessness. And I think you're right, Matt, that unless he does have a commitment to build social housing, then it's going to feel empty and it's going to feel hollow. He can be passionate about the project, he can be genuine about what he wants to do, but he can't really be authentic on it because he has never been homeless, is probably never going to be homeless, is nowhere close to it. I think it's great if this is something that he really believes in, but it does need to have a way of actually solving homelessness, which is by building homes, as well as looking at the factors of why people are homeless in the first place, why people stay on the streets, and why people are unhoused. All those things need to be tackled as well as building homes. It all needs to be all-encompassing and he is going to face questions unless he does all of that. One of the things, Matt, I, I, I took from the interview is that in, in the way that the King sees himself as a convener of people, mm -hmm. is that the kind of model that William's going to adopt here, that he can bring the various different organisations needed to make a difference here together and try and see change? He cited the example during the pandemic of the Everyone In mm -hmm. scheme. That's absolutely thing. He's going to almost become like a figurehead for like a for a, for a national campaign to, and you say it's going to be tackling those kind of things. It's going to be tackling the reasons why people are homeless, convening, bringing, and he he can do it because he has that power and he is authentic with homelessness because he has done an awful lot behind the scenes as well. You know, he was up selling big issues last summer, if you remember. Yeah, he was delivering food during He's, COVID, exactly. which we didn't actually know And, about. and within these organisations, they do respect him. But the, the problem that it's going to be is that the public will look at it and say you have. 
these vast houses, you're a massive landlord. And if it was, say, a politician that was doing this, if it's Michael Gove, the housing minister, and then we, you know, he, he will have to face some of these questions that we're raising today about, about the amount of houses that he has when he's talking about homelessness. He did it's speak brave. to Michael Gove, he did speak to Keir Starmer. Um, but, it, but in terms of what he can achieve here, Christine, what do you think we need to see from him? Well, I think that, you know, all the royals fall into this, this sticky situation where they're not really supposed to um, affect political change. Mm. They're supposed to remain apolitical. Mm -hmm. And yet this becomes a hugely political issue when you're talking about social housing. Who pays for that? And so he really has to walk a fine line between just raising awareness, which maybe isn't enough, mm -hmm. and actually taking, you know, large-scale action, which is maybe too far. And striking that balance between what he can do is going to be really difficult, I think. But I think, again, bringing the people together, bringing the right people together with the right influence is, is what we can hope for. Mm -hmm. Now, it was his birthday on Wednesday. It was Father's Day on Sunday. And we got a, another family photo released, William with the three children, uh, Christine, to mark at that day. Tell us about it. I think it was a lovely photo from a photo series taken at Windsor Castle. Um, Prince William is photographed with his children, Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. Louis sort of giving him a big cuddle. Um, and it's such a sweet very down-to-earth moment. So many people felt that it was very similar to family photos that we all have, you know, on our on our fireplace, um, taken by Millie P Pilkington, who is a, a recurring photographer for the family. Um, I think this is a very, very special moment, and it made all the, the front pages. Yeah, I think it was part of the photo shoot she'd done yes. for Louis's birthday, wasn't it? On the subject of the Wales uh, children, Prince George was spotted with his parents this week having a look around Eton College. Matt, he's still a way off. Mm. Yeah, he, I, but... I think do you have to do uh, you have to register an interest three years before, yes. is that right? Yeah. And I think they it is three years until he could possibly go to Eton. Um, they're incredibly, uh, they don't particularly like talking about the children and, and education. Now, we know he's gone to Lambrook School mm -hmm. and he's very happy there with mm -hmm. his two siblings. But there's rumours that he could go to Eton. There's also rumours he could go to Marlborough College. But Eton seems the the right place for him to go. The family's just, you know, they, they've moved Marlborough College, where the, Kate. Where Kate's uh, went to former, school. former school is. And Eton, of course, William's former school. Yeah, so uh, big decisions ahead for them. But this week, events up and down the country have celebrated 75 years since the arrival of the Empire Windrush at Tilbury Docks. How have the Royals of Fear been marking the anniversary? Mm. Uh, well, you've had Prince William uh, did a video that was on their social media page uh, talking about the impact that the generations from the Empire Windrush have had on the fabric of the United Kingdom, saying that can't be underestimated. But also there's going to be this absolutely beautiful series of portraits, mm. 10 portraits of people um, from the Windrush generation done by uh, Black artists the pictures are absolutely gorgeous really stunning they're going to be on display at Holyrood um, until October and then at the newly refurbished National Portrait Gallery uh, in London from I think mid-October uh, and so Prince Charles sorry King Charles III has been talking about that as well and talking about yes the impact that the Windrush generation had on the United Kingdom on the fabric of Britain on the great things that they have done so I think these two things are great and marking 75 years since the Empire Windrush uh, docked at Tilbury Docks and also celebrating that generation. There's not many people left, actually, who arrived on Empire Windrush that are still here today. But celebrating that enormous contribution and yeah. the portraits were commissioned by the King when he was Prince Charles. Matt. Yeah, no, exactly. As I say the portraits are absolutely wonderful. Oh, they're um, beautiful. So, but I, I thought found is interesting with William's comment and and with everything. They're talking about the Commonwealth, remember? So mm -hmm. it is very important now. Um, obviously, they come from Jamaica. You know, the, the, the original Windrush come from Jamaica. But talking about. The, you know, we know what's happening in certain areas or certain areas of um, uh, the Caribbean that might want to get rid of the, the, the king and stuff like that. So I think it's, I think the, I think they all they mean it when they talk about Windrush. Mm -hmm. They mean it when they talk about these things in, in, in the coronation. And um, yeah, it's definitely very welcome. Meghan's popularity among the British public has fallen to an all-time low. That's according to a new poll by YouGov. It now stands at minus forty-seven. Uh, Christine, I know you've been having a look at the numbers in this. Any surprises? 
I, I don't think anyone listening will be particularly surprised. You know, the Duchess of Sussex is particularly unpopular within the UK. She might have slightly more popularity in the US, which I think is really where they're building their brand. That's where their priorities lie. The, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex aren't really concerned with what the British people think of them, but ultimately they're still the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. So it creates a really interesting conversation as their popularity continues to fall. But Matt, just looking at some of the other uh, figures, so Meghan down, Harry's uh, down, six in 10 people have a positive view of King Charles. The monarchy favourability is up since before mm -hmm. the coronation, 25%, but considerably down on last September where it stood at 44%, but last September, of course, being the mm. death of the Queen. Well, I think <clears throat> when people see, you know, the coronation, when they see trooping and see events like that, I think I th people remember how great it is, you know, and, that you, you, and I think when the more that the royals actually come up for these big, big events, the more popular they are, and I think that's great. It, that was the Queen's mantra, wasn't it? You've got to be seen to be believed, and actually that's really, really important uh, to them. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit more about trooping and garter and ascot uh, in a short time. The most popular royal... Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you announce this one. Princess Anne, the Princess, Princess Anne. Royal. The most popular royal, lots, lots of people saying the most hardworking royal. Look, she is out there putting in the work, attending royal events. She is the queen of keep calm and carry on. Uh, and, you know, I think it's really not surprising at all that she's at the top of the polls. I mean, she's long been an ever popular royal, but I think, you know, she has really sort of stepped out in front along with the new Duchess of Edinburgh, actually, mm. uh, who's up in the polls as well. But it's not surprising that Princess Anna's up there as, as the most popular royal. Um, yeah, and it's great to see her there. And well-deserved place, I think. And what's interesting about this, Matt, is it's Princess Anne isn't going to be pictured on the front page mm. of every newspaper, is she? She gets on with her engagements with mm. little fuss, little fanfare, and that seems to be paying off in the public eye. Yeah, exactly. There's no biographies, there's no memoirs, there's no Netflix shows. I mean, maybe that's the way to go forward. But people do respect, as you say, that the, 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 A, she doesn't um, get much exposure, but we all know and we all respect that she's doing so much work, so much work behind the scenes. You know, she, she, she always wins at the end of the year when they do a list of the most engagements. And I think people respect that mm. with Anne, definitely. But we don't hear much from her. You're right, we don't hear much from her at all. There was one interview um, just before the coronation and went, every word that she said in that, everyone kind of agreed and thought she was, thought she was fantastic. But I think a population will, will, will you know, keep going, definitely. And hugely important in that supporting role that she plays uh, to the king. Now, Spotify's head of podcast innovation and monetization has labelled Prince Harry and Meghan grifters after their $20 million multi-year deal to make podcasts with the streaming platform came to an end. They had made just 12 episodes. Last week, Spotify and Archwell Audio released a joint statement saying they had mutually agreed to part ways and are proud of the series we made together. However, sources close to Spotify have said the royal couple did not meet the productivity benchmark required to receive the full headline payout from the deal. Um, let me get your take on this, yes. uh, Christine, at first. Obviously mutually agreeing to part ways? How mutual was it? I don't know that it was entirely mutual because I think this was such a huge platform for Meghan, for Meghan and Harry's brand, but Spotify wasn't getting out of it what they had wanted. It, they had a tremendous, it was a three year deal, three year deal. And yet we only saw these 12 episodes. One of them was sort of a Christmas special. And so it really wasn't the sort of churn out that I think Spotify was used to in terms of their biggest, highest paid podcast. So I don't imagine that this was really as mutual as we, as they would like us to believe. You know, we're now hearing that some of the episodes um, were recorded with producers, not necessarily with Megan herself, and then she was added afterwards. So I think Spotify may have been questioning what exactly it was they were paying so much money for when they weren't seeing the work. And yet a fear when it, when it came out, it went straight to the top of the Spotify charts, didn't it? It, it won awards. Yeah. Absolutely, it did. And, you know, it was streamed millions and millions of times by people. Loads of people listened to it. And actually, um, just on the finer point of the production of the podcast, I mean, it, 
you know, there was producers involved who would do interviews with experts, psychologists, who you would sort of drop in later to comment on what the discussion was between Megan and your main guest, or Megan and Serena. So the Megan big interviews, Carey, yeah. She would uh, do. She would do, and you know, producers would do the other bits and, and drop them in, and you know, she always thanked them. They were always credited. So I guess you know, perhaps there's oh, there's definitely creative differences in the way that. Spotify wanted to produce the podcast and the way that Archwell wanted to produce the podcast. But also I think we have to remember that we're in a backdrop of Spotify shedding 2% of their staff in the podcast division, that's 200 people, because they overspent. They spent $500 million on podcasts in 2019. Um, even the head of Spotify... And they talked about getting over the, overexcited. Yeah, I mean, they even said themselves, we have overspent in this mm -hmm. division. And, you know, Brainy Brown, you know, their podcast was... Their lifestyle podcast was ended as well. Uh, the Obamas have taken their deal to Amazon Audible. So I think there's two stories at play here. There's Spotify who have overspent on podcasts and clearly overspent on, on archetypes, clearly overspent on it. The deal was far too big. They didn't get what they wanted. Um, and I think also massive creative differences. Archwell didn't deliver. I'm sure they're going to take it somewhere else. Well, those creative differences, Matt, I want to get your take on what, what? Bill Simmons said oh. when he told them bleep grifters. Yeah, there was an said, expletive before grifters. Yes, wasn't there? there was. Yeah. Um, and said, you've got to get me drunk one night mm. and I'll tell you the story of the Zoom I had with Harry to try and help him with a podcast idea. It's one of my best stories. He yes. said, it's not a very flattering portrayal, is it's it? It's not, but we've kind of heard this, these, these kind of portrayals when they were here, when they were, work, when they were working royals back in the UK. People were said that it was, they, you know, in the palace, uh, later told us that they were quite difficult to deal with and, you know, quite demanding. Um, so I, the Americans are maybe beginning to learn that that's how they operate. Um, that's just one person's opinion, remember. Mm. And I don't often do this, but I want to maybe give uh, Meghan and Harry the benefit of doubt on Spotify. I think that... Um, she's gonna. She's pivoting away from appearing in front of the camera, and they, they're not going to be out talking about themselves because every time they appear on on Spotify or Netflix, the stories are all about them. Mm. No matter what she says, if she's mm -hmm. talking about um, yeah. different things, and they're trying to, they're trying to, trying to, yeah, trying to get her off, you know, front facing media. And I, I give the benefit of that. I think. It is mutually agreed. I, I, that's the indication it's, I'm getting that, that that they are quite happy to go away and launch some other projects with them behind the camera. Other yeah. projects being a deal with deal <laughs> or not? Because much briefed, much talked about at the beginning of this week, mm. and yet now deal appearing to distance themselves. Well, it seems like they uh, they don't need to have a deal because we're all talking about it. So if it as exactly. a media strategy, so that's yeah, the point. Yeah, yeah. you know, they don't need to sign a mega deal. But it was really interesting. Harry, uh, I was at the court case last week, and he turned up in a dual suit. He did, mm -hmm. yeah. And he, and he went at the coronation. They put a press release out, and this isn't unusual. I mean, Bruce Oldfield did a big interview about designing Camilla's uh, dress for the coronation. Mm -hmm. um, some designers do actually. You probably know better than me, but some designers do actually uh, announce uh, that, that, that certain members of the royal family are wearing their clothes. Wearing their clothes, but yeah, it's I think a big deal for them, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, but I would say it, it's a little bit different, Matt, and I'll tell you why. Mm. We have no idea who designed Prince William's suit for the coronation, mm. and quite frankly, I don't know who you know designed any of the other men at the coronation. Um, so I think Dior publicising Prince Harry that has to be purposeful and thought through because generally we don't follow men's fashion. You know, sometimes we get the odd exciting piece when. Prince William steps out in velvet slippers with airplanes. That was quite interesting. But overall, men's fashion is it's a whole different world from, from women's fashion, from who's designing the dresses and the gowns. So I think there has to be a, a purpose to this and a thought out process to this. That was a purposeful press release set out from Dior's office. Mm. I, be, I would be led to believe that that was sort of okayed by the team back in Montecito. So I think this might not be the end of that story. Mm. Mm. They, they said this week, Dior though, didn't they, that they haven't had any recent contact with them. Um, yeah, but they clearly affairs. have because like we've just yeah. been discussing, Harry wore Dior to at the coronation and they put a press release about it and he wore Dior when he was in court yeah. and they never said no he did not. So. I don't know, maybe this is a precursor to something coming and they don't want to, you know, announce it too soon. But like you said, Matt, 
we're all talking yeah. about it. So we're all doing their work for them. Um, and if we are going to talk about people wearing Dior this week, I mean, we saw the Queen wearing Dior at Ascot and everybody was like, oh. Was it a coincidence? <laughs> oh. I just think it was a coincidence, to be honest. I would, I, I would like to live in a world where people don't overly think that much. These things are often planned. You know, um, sometimes they will, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine, they would wear blue at certain events, or blue or yellow. And so uh, when, when, when we realised that it was the first day I got that it was Dior, I thought it was kind of a little, little mm. planned, a little nod to mm. the, personally. Well, and you, you spotted another nod. Christine in the Ascot yes, fashion. Yes, her, which... her second day at Ascot, she wore the same outfit that she wore to Meghan and Harry's wedding. So I am not convinced that there are no coincidences. I don't know what that message might be, but two days in a row makes me wonder what it, what what she's trying to say behind the scenes. I think Queen Camilla is quite, she's, she's a bit funny, isn't she? She has a good sense of humour, so she might be humouring us. OK, well, let's talk a bit more about Ascot and all of the big events that have been taking place over the course of the last week, because on Saturday it was Trooping the Colour, the King's first birthday parade, his official birthday at Celebrated. We had Garter Day in Windsor on Monday, and then we've had Royal Ascot, as we've been discussing. Uh, Matt, you've had a busy time then at yeah. Trooping the Colour. Should we start with that? Trooping was lovely. Um, we hadn't seen it, last year with the Platinum Jubilee mm -hmm. we had last year. We hadn't seen it for several years because of because of COVID. And the most impressive thing was Charles on the horse. He had been yes. practicing all week, mm. but um, it, it, we hadn't had a monarch since 1986. The yeah. Queen was was last. I mean, fair play, Charles. He, he looked a bit nervous. The horse was not behaving mm. very risky. well. Was a bit yeah, I got a bit worried. Mm. Actually, at Horse Guards Parade, he was. But he, yeah, I thought he did a fantastic job, and I enjoy trooping. As a child, I used to find it boring, but now I absolutely love it. It's, and the, there was huge crowds out there, and there was a lovely fly past. I mean, you must enjoy that, surely. It was hot, though, wasn't mm. it? Uh, but not hot as, day, hot not as, as hot as the previous weekend when Prince William was inspecting troops and mm. they were collapsing all over the place. I mean, it wasn't as hot. And like you said, we had the the full fly pass, which was amazing, and we had the, the CR as well, which Yeah, was, that was lovely. It was lovely, yeah. That's what we should have got on Coronation yeah. Day, isn't mm. it? But we got rain instead. <laughs> <laughs> and can we talk about Louis? Absolutely. Prince Louis is so charming. He really is um, a highlight of these events uh, because he's so genuine. There's no pretense, there's no pomp and ceremony to Louis. He is just a five-year-old little boy. He's very animated and he makes for fantastic pictures. And I just love his double-handed waving. It's my <laughs> favourite. The salute. The salute. Yeah. There was a lovely moment when I was at Horse Guards um, where, because they'd been watching from a from window over over the top, yeah. and he, he's, I don't think it was on camera, because he, he came down with George, uh, sorry, with George and Charlotte, and they'd gone to the carriage, and he was in the back of the carriage, and you saw him go, where's my daddy? Oh. And, then, so he, and, it, so, and it was just, you're just a child, you know, he's always, we, we find him very entertaining, but he then climbed on the back of the carriage and saw his daddy on on the horse and went, oh, there's my daddy. And it was oh. just such a lovely moment, a lovely family moment, you know? Yeah. So I enjoyed it. Cute. Yeah, and we had um, Camilla wearing red. We had Kate in the green. Yeah. What were the symbolisms around those choices? Well, Kate's association with the Irish guards meant that she wore the green outfit by Andrew Ng, I think I've said that correctly, um, with the green hat and she had um, a gold I think shamrock, it was shamrock yeah, thank yeah. you, brooch as well. And then Camilla in the red, which was kind of like a military style dress, wasn't it? Who was that by? It was, I can't, I failed to remember the designer, yes, but it was too. inspired by her new um, ceremonial military position in that even the amount of buttons yeah. and the details on the back and the epaulets all match the the, um, the uniform. regiment that she was representing as colonel. And so it was a really, really special, well thought out mm. fashion moment. How powerful to really, it almost even though she was in the carriage, she was on a balcony, it almost was there with her, with her men, you know, so mm. to speak, standing um, very proudly to represent them. And Garter Day on Monday in Windsor, the oldest uh, order of chivalry, the most senior order of chivalry in the UK. And obviously we had the members of the Order of the Garter, that the knights uh, wearing the full robes, the plumed headdresses, the, the plumed hats. Um, you had a, a keen eye on the fashions there, and in particular, the Princess of Wales. What did you yes. notice? Um, well, I think the Princess of Wales and the Duchess of Edinburgh sort of took centre stage underneath that tent, you know, greeting everyone as they walked past. And the Princess of Wales was in a 
polka dot um, bespoke gown by Alessandra Rich, which was almost identical to the polka dot gown she wore last year at Ascot, and undeniably similar to an outfit that Princess Diana wore to Ascot in the 1980s. And we're definitely seeing a theme in her fashions, lots of 1980s trends, which are very, very big right now. Any fashion journalist will tell you the 80s are really alive and well. Um, but it, again, these purposeful fashion choices, these really thought out decisions, um, are really interesting if you follow them. The, the feathers and the flowers on her hat matched the polka dots on her dress, um, her bespoke shoes from Camilla Elphick. The, these are all you know, London-based designers, really thoughtful, but again, identical to what she wore, or nearly identical, I should say, to what she wore to Ascot last year. And talking of Ascot, you've been there this week, Matt, I've been there uh, this week. Um, the first royal ascot of King Charles's reign. Now, this was a huge event for Queen Elizabeth, wasn't it? Perhaps a little less so for Charles, but Camilla mm. taking up that uh, mantle. But they've been there throughout the week. It, it's a real show of support for British horse racing and the whole industry that comes with it, because you know it brings in a lot of money and so many people are employed in the horse racing business. Because obviously it was very important to late Queen Elizabeth mm. and we weren't sure whether Charles and Camilla would still be interested in owning all these horse races, but they're, they're going to be there every day this week, which is a huge, you know. I'm not convinced that Charles particularly enjoys watching the horse racing. I think Camilla enjoys watching the horse racing, but I think it was just a, a show of commitment, I, th I, I think. Um, and there was a lovely, they wrote about Queen Elizabeth II on the first day in the, in, in the race card. There was a message um, talking about her legacy with British horse racing. So I think it was a really good, sim very symbolic, I think, that they were there all week. I was there on Tuesday and the King had a, a runner saga. Well, they're not doing very well, not the horses. Not doing very well so far <laughs> at the time of, of, of us filming, but they were really animated they were. there uh, in the Royal Box. But, but there is a nod to the Queen uh, as well, Afia, because an exhibition in her memory mm -hmm. uh, as you go into the Royal Enclosure. I mean, she was so associated with this event. It's impossible to separate the two, really, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. It's actually hard to think about Royal Ascot without the Queen being there, without Queen Elizabeth II being there. And then, yes, like you said, you have these gorgeous pictures by Chris Jackson um, all over Ascot, just absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I think it's great, actually, that the King decided to be there every day of Ascot because we want it to be Royal Ascot. And that's mm. great for race goers. It's great for the jockeys, for the runners, for riders. Everyone that's associated with this huge meeting to have that royal stamp really takes it up a level. So yeah, it's great that he's been there lending his support. Like you said, Camilla and the Duchess of Benderborough as well, enjoying their racing over the past few days. So, you know, everyone had a lovely time and the weather played ball as well. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Afia, Christine and Matt. We will be back next week with all of the latest on the royal family. We hope you can join us. We'll see you then.